Hello and welcome to Good Conversations. My name is Thompson Smith. We're honored to have with us today Dr. Kate Shanley, Professor of Native American Studies at the University of Montana in Missoula, where she has taught since 1999 when she became the first chair of the Native American Studies Department. Kate is an enrolled member of the Fort Peck Assiniboine Tribe, and before coming to UM, she taught at Cornell and at the University of Washington in Seattle. She now serves as the Special Assistant to the Provost for Native American and Indigenous Studies. Thanks, Kate, for being here today. Thank Welcome. you for having me. Um, well, you're a tenured professor at UM, and um, I know from our long friendship that your brother Jim uh, is the head of the, uh, the Tribal College at Fort Peck. Uh, mm -hmm. You seem to have a, a family that's really excelled in education. Um, what's the background there that you can <laughs> <laughs> tell us? Well, I don't, I, I have lots of ways of joking about that. Hmm. Um, but in general, my sister was a big influence on us. Hmm. She was older than the rest of us. She's eight years older than me. And eventually went on to become a medical doctor. And she was always encouraging us hmm. to go to college. Hmm. I remember her coming home when I was in junior high school saying, get a job because you have to go to college. You hmm. have to save money for college. And the other influence was my mother, who read all the time. Hmm. There was, it was just, there were always books in the house, and she, she wasn't someone to talk about what she read, but every once in a while she'd quote something, or she especially liked writers like Pearl S. Buck, hmm. and, um, The Good Earth. Yeah, mm -hmm. that kind of, um, John Steinbeck yeah. and authors like that. But she read Margaret Mead and many yeah. other people. Oh. And I remember when I was older, in my 20s probably, I bought her Blackberry Winter, which is the biography of Margaret Mead, and she was thrilled because huh. her reading tastes had changed quite a bit. Nice. But so I think that kind of influence and then having a family that where less than A wasn't an acceptable thing. Mm -hmm. We were expected not just to graduate from high school, but to all excel. Wow, and had anyone, had any, your parents or anyone of their generation, your family been to college themselves? No. Mm -hmm. And what, how do you explain your mother's love of reading and, and her whole inclination that way? I don't, I honestly don't know except that she was married uh, before my, before she married my father, she was married to a man who had been working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Poplar. Mm -hmm. And she married him when she was a senior in high school, finished high school. And then she didn't have children for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And some of that time she had um, things to do outside of the home. Mm -hmm. But she was a reader and she had the opportunity to read. Mm. And you were growing up most of your childhood in Poplar? Most of my childhood. Mm -hmm. My mother remarried when I was um, junior in high school. We moved to Williston. Williston, North Dakota. Yeah, okay. just across the border. Right, and so you graduated from high school there. Yes. And didn't go immediately into academia at that point, did you? No, it, it took me five years, uh -huh. in fact, because we didn't have any money. Right. I mean, when you're poor, you don't, you can't go to school. Yeah. And those were the days when, um, I don't know how people finance their education, yeah. but I was a strong student, but I didn't win a scholarship to college. Mm -hmm. And so, even though I applied to college, and even had a room in the dorm mm -hmm. <laughs> waiting for me, yeah. I just have found no way to go. Wow. At which college? Jamestown. Jamestown, University of North Dakota. No, Jamestown, I think it's called Jamestown College. Jamestown College, oh, okay. Yeah. And so first you you pursued nursing for a while. Well, I, I did a lot of things. I worked in many, many kinds of jobs, waitress. Um, in my lifetime, I've made beds and motels and cleaned yards, cleaned houses, all kinds of things. But I got a job at a place called the Work Opportunity Center in Minneapolis. They didn't have the phrase then for it, but it was for at-risk kids. 
and it was kind of a vocational high school where kids could go at their own pace. And I was their outreach worker. Cool. Who went, I went out in the community and brought the kids to school if they didn't have money for the bus or mm -hmm. if they missed t a certain period of time, I would go to see what was wrong and if there's some way we could help them. Mm -hmm. And the secretary in the office said that she was going to go to a nursing program. In two years, she could be an RN. And I, I just thought, wow, I could actually make enough of a salary that maybe I could go to college. If I got into a nursing program and then got a two-year degree, then I could put myself through the rest of whatever I want to do. And so you did that? So I did that. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, you then went on to, to get your BA. You worked as a nurse for a few years, is, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, worked for a, I worked as a nurse on and off for about seven years. And then I got the bachelor's degree in English and the master's and PhD. And what, what inspired you to, to not continue with nursing and to instead pursue uh, a BA and, and then go on from there? Nursing, I never saw nursing as the place for me in an ultimate sense. Mm -hmm. When I worked in psychiatric nursing, for example, I was the only nurse that the doctors allowed to use the dictaphone because I told such good stories. <laughs> And they, and they were helpful to the doctors, the psychiatrists. Huh. And I felt like nurses' notes were not adequate for what I wanted to say about the human struggle or things of that nature. And so, but it wasn't just, I didn't go into nursing with the idea I would stay in nursing. Mm -hmm. It was a means to an end. Sure. And I, I always thought I wanted to be involved in writing and literature. Yeah. I didn't imagine I would be an academic. Yeah. I always thought I'd be some other kind of writer. Yeah. Um, and I may be before I die. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. So, well, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, do you, do you often, in, in, your, in your work now as a teacher at the university level, as a professor, as an administrator, do you think that the, that probably fairly unusual background among your colleagues in academia serves you in certain ways and informs your work? It must. Yeah. Um, I th generally speaking, I think students f find, I never have discipline problems in my classroom, for example. Now that all colleagues are complaining about people texting and all these kinds of problems they're having in the social atmosphere of the classroom. I don't find that I have those problems. No one ever treats me disrespectfully. Anytime there's been a dispute about a grade, people have always come to me. They've never gone above my head. So there's something about the range of experiences, I think, that makes students feel more comfortable with me. Some are intimidated, but that's the nature of power and <laughs> whatnot. But in terms of the subject matter, I think I'm, by nature, interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. as opposed to someone who would be very focused on a field, say mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. or um, a science field. Mm -hmm. I'm someone who has a, a kind of broad-based interest and aptitude for interdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. And my background fits that as well. A broad life experience, it fits, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm wondering though too, as a professor in the classroom, um, do you see students who in a sense remind, remind you of yourself at that age? And your, does your own experience end up serving you in your work with them? When, well in my, two, primarily, primarily as a university professor I've taught in three places, University of Washington, Cornell, and here. And at each one of those places offered a different kind of experience yeah. for my particular background, skill set, and so on. Mm -hmm. I was, of course, younger at the University of Washington. I taught there seven years. And 
I loved the fact that there were many older students in my classes. Mm. And at that time, the, when I meant older students, they were my age. Um, I don't have students my age anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but um, then at Cornell, I regularly taught classes full of 17 and 18 year olds. And they are top 3% of their high school. Right. Um, Ivy League school. Ivy League school. But they, had a, they were very interestingly engaged as well. It's just, I was older, mm -hmm. they were the age of my, they were between the ages of my two sons who are 20 years apart. Yeah. And then, so there's a lot of um, challenge, a different pedagogical challenge, and many people don't realize this, but Cornell is half Ivy and half state, and the American Indian Studies was in the state side of the school. Mm -hmm. And I had an appointment between the endowed side and the state side. Mm -hmm. I was half English and half American Indian Studies. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the students who come in through the state side aren't um, rich kids necessarily, or they haven't been to prep schools. Mm -hmm. um, they're just very smart kids. Right. Yeah. And it's a different school than people think from the outside. It's not exactly like Harvard. Um, or Princeton, mm -hmm. that heavily that heavily endowed, um, and then the University of Montana. I don't think I was as prepared when I came for how rural Montana is. Mm -hmm. Even though I grew up in a very small town, <laughs> we thought Wolf Point was a big city at 2,200 or something. <laughs> and um, but still, both the experience at Cornell and the experience at University of Washington involved urban, more urban student populations. Hmm. That's interesting. And so Montana's had that kind of a challenge. Right. So you teach literature uh, primarily at, at the University of Montana, right? No, what, I, what? actually I don't. Oh. In, in my career, I started out in an English department and an, being an adjunct to Indian Studies. That was at the University of Washington. Then I had the first faculty appointment in American Indian Studies at Cornell. And I was between those two, the program and the English department. My tenure actually was in English when I got tenured. And then I moved entirely into Native American Studies when I came here. So I teach oral and written traditions, contemporary Indian literature, but I also teach religion and philosophy, gender studies. Um, I've taught cultures expressed through language. I um, see some other, I teach autobiography. Hmm. So I teach a range of classes. Sounds great. I want to take them all. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, well, they're fun to teach. I'm sure. And we're going to continue with that in just one second. We're going to take a one minute break. Please don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. In February 2009, most television stations will convert to digital transmission and no longer provide analog service. Low power translators and Class A stations are not required to cease analog broadcasts. For more information, call 275-4878. If you watch television on cable or satellite only, you need not do anything. If you watch free, over-the-air TV, you may need a converter box if your TV set is not digital. Set-top converter box coupons worth $40 toward the purchase of these devices can be requested by calling 888-388-2009 or visiting www.dtv2009.gov. When purchasing a set-top box, be sure it has analog pass-through if you intend to watch analog and digital stations. These devices are listed on the dtv2009.gov website. Call 275-4878 if you need assistance or information. And welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. Kate Shanley, professor of Native American Studies at the University of Montana, and an old friend of mine, so it's a little funny for us to be conducting such a formal conversation, <laughs> isn't it, Kate? Yes, indeed. <laughs> but uh, uh, maybe not too formal, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but before the break, we were talking a little bit about some of the classes you teach, and are there 
Is there one or two classes that really stands out for you as some of the favorites that you've taught that just you enjoy the most as a teacher? Well, this past year, my colleague Dave Beck was on leave on sabbatical, and so I got to teach religion and philosophy for the first time. And I felt as though I'd waited my whole life to teach that course. Huh. Because when I was young, I was raised in a, my mother was adamantly against sending me to boarding school. Believe it or not, I was an Indian person who wanted to go to boarding school. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of that before. <laughs> yes, because all my girlfriends were going and I just wanted so badly to go and my mother said no. And I was a seeker, an idealist and so on. So at the age of 15, I decided, well, the most important question is, is there a God? And if you don't answer that question, if there's a God and the God, ha the God being has some plan for you, you better figure it out. Right. <laughs> but then if you don't, if he, she, it doesn't, then you better figure that out too. So all my life I've had sort of deep f philosophical questions ruminating around religion. Hmm. And I studied all kinds of religious practices. Um, my, I've been involved in our own tradition at home in Medicine Lodge for 21 years now. Hmm. And that's a deeply satisfying experience for me. But the questions don't go away. No. Yeah. And um, if anyone has them bottled up or um, tightly sewn together, I'd love to see them. Yeah. But all the, the function on the idea of is there a soul? What is the nature of self in a particular cultural context? Mm -hmm. And what does community and ritual and ceremony have to do with a connection with the sacred? Mm -hmm. What is the sacred? Mm -hmm. Those are amazing and wonderful questions mm. that guide me in some intellectual thinking and, and also in living. Um, I w I'm not going to talk about my own particular beliefs in those ways, but I love having students think about them. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are two Im really important things in Native American studies for students to understand. And one of them is to get some kind of inkling of the depth of cultural differences. Mm. And the other is to understand the history and workings of US policy toward indigenous people on the continent. Mm -hmm. And those two things aren't the same, but students should come out of classes with some sense of each of those. Right. So yeah. I, in that course, I teach things around the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act and American Indian Religious Freedom Act. And we, t we have to pull those two worlds together. Absolutely. So that's, I think, the class I like the most. Hmm. And uh, I said before the break, I want to take all your classes. I especially want to take that one. <laughs> um, of all the, the readings you had in the class, which one did you find provoked the most productive or interesting, stimulating discussion? Or was, was there one that stood out that way? Mm. Well, the students are more accustomed to political or social critique. Mm -hmm. And so when we got to an article I assigned on New Agers mm -hmm. and appropriation of Native things, they were both um, guilty of some of it mm -hmm. and vocal mm -hmm. because it's their world. Yeah. And that I think provokes the most mm -hmm. of that nature in them. But I also teach a book called Yaki Deer Songs and we see some archival footage that isn't, it isn't presented in a uh, polished Hollywood way. Mm -hmm. It's, but it's a, uh, Yaki deer ceremony that is a it's a syncretic religion that 
combines elements of Christianity with traditional Yaqui thought. Mm -hmm. And so the songs to the deer become like the songs to Christ mm -hmm. and the parallels between those religious thought worlds come together. My, my husband, whom you also know, David Moore, um, for he, a few years. Yes. <laughs> I think since 1983. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he comes into my class when I teach Yaki Deer songs, mm. and he teaches them a song. Mm. And I think that the, the rhythm of it is, is uh, very rapid mm. and oddly syncopated. So students feel, the ones who are mu very musically inclined feel, I think stimulated by his depth of mu music knowledge because yeah. he's himself a musician. Yeah, a but musician. so he will talk about how the song is put together in a complicated way that a m student of music would appreciate. But at the same time, we sing the song over and over until we get them, try to get them to kind of s singing it really loudly. Hmm. Yeah. And they feel moved by that. And I choose that text because it's pu public, the Yaqui people have sanctioned it, it's fully collaborative, it examines its own process of production, and so it brings all those issues together in terms of religion over time, syn syncretism of religious thought, retention of old ways, hmm. absorption of new ways into old ways. That sounds fascinating. Um, I, I imagine the syncopation sounds odd to to my ears, but not to Iyaki's ears. <laughs> when you mentioned mm -hmm. oddly syncopated. Uh, e even those things are, of course, culturally defined. Uh, mm -hmm. well, what's an odd syncopation, what isn't? But, um, you know, you mentioned David, and, and of course David, uh, when I first knew him, was teaching here at SKC. and. We're recording this interview at SKC. It brings the question to mind of how you see uh, the relationship between the university and tribal colleges. And we just have a few minutes left in this program, and so if we want, we might end up continuing this in the next program, but I wanted to at least begin that, that issue with you. Um, you served as chair of NAS for many years at, at the University of Montana, and how would you like to, how, how would you like to see that relationship further develop, or how is it developing that's good? I'm, I'm very persuaded that tribal colleges are the, probably the best thing that's happened to Indian country um, since the good things that happened during the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. Mm -hmm. or some, the, the movement itself has built communities at the same time it's, as it's prepared people for university and academic training and provided vocational training and skills. So the movement is, is fabulous. There in the, there's a kind of kink in the pipeline from the tribal colleges to the university system. And some models of linkage have worked better than others. So it's a kind, it's an elaborate um, question with an elaborate kind of answer I could give. But simply sp speaking, I just think we ought, we ought to be uh, making joint programs and degree programs and um, projects. And the University of Montana, for the first time this last year, was able to offer Blackfeet language. Hmm. We did that. To be, due to the good graces of Blackfeet Community College, who allowed us to pipe Marvin Weatherwax's classes to us. Hmm. And then we had um, Annabelle Chatsis, who's uh, from the Blood Reserve, as a student at the time, so she was the person on campus who did the language labs with the students. Hmm. And so for the first time, we're able to offer a substantial language course. Um, that's the, an example of a kind of collaboration that works well. Right. And uh, did, did you spend much of your time when you were uh, head of NAS at the University of Montana kind of addressing the relationship with tribal colleges? Did that end up being a major focus for you? There's a, there are so many embedded questions in that. Okay. First, I'd say 
as chair of Native American Studies, I taught half time. So the position when I took it, when I took on that position, it had, it was everything in the kitchen sink. I was student support, the head of the Native Student Support, um, kind of tribal college liaison, tribal liaison, PR person, Indian Ed for All. <laughs> I mean, all these, um, all the straggler things that were Native related on campus ended up coming my way, mm -hmm. even though my half time was really for being chair of NAS. So my plate was very full. And oh, <laughs> when I stepped down, now there are four, actually four positions for the duties that I had as chair. Mm -hmm. um, Wow. The, you know, they're not so awful. You, four people are trying to do the job that you did yourself. That's right. And that's what institutional growth is like. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's just. And if you hadn't done that hard work for those years, maybe those four positions wouldn't have emerged out of that. That's right. Yeah. I mean, somebody's got to be the one in the gap. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you were it. I was. <laughs> and we're grateful you were. I'm sorry to say we're out of time for this half hour, but I'm happy to say we're going to continue for another program next week. I want to thank our viewers for being with us. Um, if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for the program, please email them to us at goodtalk at blackfoot.net. I want to thank Dr. Kate Shanley again for being with us this week, and we'll be back, I'm happy to say, with her again next week. Thanks for being with us. So long. <laughs>